<laughs> Let's welcome in our uh, next guest, Alex Gasserud. He is a candidate for the congressional seat currently held by Alex Mooney and uh, is in a field right now of uh, at least four, as I understand it. Alex, good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me. Good, we, good to be back. We had you by telephone previously. It's good to see you in person. What are you doing in the area? Well, last night I attended the uh, Jefferson County Republican Executive Committee and Berkeley County Republican Club Lincoln Day Dinner. Uh, so connected with voters there and got to listen to several candidates uh, tell us why they should be the next governor. Uh, listen to my opponent, Riley Moore, speak as well. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, Alex, uh, how did you decide to run for Congress? I know we covered this by the, on the phone a couple months ago, but uh, let's have the in-person story. Yeah, so I've always had a calling to service since I was a kid. Uh, I've always Which been... wasn't that long ago, I think. No, yeah, I'm, I'm only 31, <laughs> so it wasn't that long ago. So probably from the time I was six or seven years old, uh, I've been interested in politics. Uh, kind of got my start in politics uh, in the 2000 election. You know, the parents let me stay up a little later than usual. Was told before, you know, the, the night really got underway, we'll know who wins tonight. This is kind of how these things work. I don't remember the Clinton elections, obviously. And uh, woke up the next morning, and did we win? Dad said, I think so, but I'm not sure. Um, so from that point on, I was like, all right, I'm not going to listen to these adults anymore about <laughs> politics uh, and try to find some things out for myself. So that, And then, of course, I started a young Republican club in high school during the 2008 election cycle. Where would you go to high school? Uh, Elkins High School. Uh, graduated in 2010. Uh, three-sport athlete there. Uh, was... Uh, involved in different different activities, including starting a young Republican club. We had about 60 members. We did various cannabis canvassing um, as well as grassroots uh, and debate uh, sort of activities. Uh, of course, we know Obama won, so our efforts weren't exactly uh, a winning effort. But I don't we, think he won West Virginia, though. No, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, so you did well. We, yeah, we kind of knew that going in there yeah. at that point. But uh, yeah, so so we we did that and. Uh, had about 60 members, so very active, uh, very politically active as a kid. And then, of course, I went to college and got a degree in political science. And uh, what really called me to service even more than my natural inclination for it was what I was hearing in those classrooms at my uh, college, Davidson Elkins College. Uh, had a very liberal professor, hailed from the Ivy League. Uh, it was really me, a lone conservative in, in these political thought, political philosophy classes. Sometimes it was one on 9, 10, 15, 20 at a time. Our classes weren't too big uh, because very few people want to engage with that sort of subject matter. But we listened and, and read uh, a lot of left-wing uh, authors and works, particularly Karl Marx. Uh, and a lot of the things that they were telling me at the time, um, I, I come to come to find out that this is neo-Marxism. And they're telling me things like, we're going to change the name of your football team. I'm a Washington Redskins fan, or I was anyway. Uh, not anymore because they're not a team. But they told me they're going to change the name of my football team. They told me that there's going to be reparations. We see now reparations being weighed heavily in the nation. Uh, they you know, also were telling me that because I was born in 1992, and I was a white, straight, conservative male that believed in God, um, I have natural advantages and privileges that others in the society don't. And I philosophically, fundamentally disagree with that. Uh, and, and at the time, they were arguing for, this is the first pl- time where I heard diversity, equity, and inclusion being used. And that's really the governing principle of neo-Marxism. And you're seeing the neo-Marxist agenda uh, at that time when I was in college about seven, eight, nine years ago. Uh, it was already 20 years in the making, uh, 30 years in the making, really. And, and now we're seeing it be implemented in our society because the neo-Marxist is in charge of our corporations, they're in charge of our media, they're in charge of our government, that's just not elected officials. And uh, what they're going to end up doing is create mass suffering, it's going to lead in the streets. So that's why I'm standing up now to go to Washington, D.C. to fight this, this idea, this perverse ideology, um, and, and try to take the country back and restore American values. And what can an elected congressional official do about these things that you just flagged? Well. The first thing is we have to go there and fight intellectually and spirit and defeat these ideas. Uh, We need a rural check specifically in Washington, D.C. to go take on the anti-Americanism in the Congress. Uh, Particularly, I think of somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Representative Ilhan Omar, probably the entire California Democrat delegation. Uh, and, And we have to really stand up and show that these ideas are wrong and defeat them verbally. Uh, and it's important we do that. And I think I have a certain skill set to, to be able to do that. I, I was on my debate team in college. We traveled around different 
uh, colleges and universities. You know, I, I'm I'm familiar with taking uh, liberals on in person w- w- in debate, and I think we need to send somebody that's going to fight for us. But I also think we need to send somebody that's not involved in the political class. Uh, we need to send working class Americans that have a natural ability for this to Washington D.C. to try to take the country back. I'm also not bought and paid for like the majority of these politicians are. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever made someone in debate cry? Because my co-host, John Gilstrap, in his past, has made a girl cry during debate during his high school years. Yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely uh, had some people emotionally get, get uncorked. Uh, you know, I've, I've had definitely some big run-ins, especially thinking about college. But I can't remember anybody melting down, but I'm sure that, that, that they were crying at some point during that day. Now, I usually go to Bill here, but because of what Mr. Gilstrap <laughs> has done in his past, I'm going to go to him first on this one. I, I didn't make her cry. <laughs> it was during cross-examination, and she just didn't have the answers, and I kept pushing, and I got worst speaker points. Actually, we should have won, but I got I got fourth-place speaker points because I made her cry. Okay. Yeah, I know. That was, I learned a lesson. Yeah. There's a lesson you learned. <laughs> Any guess happens when John goes, just watch her start crying. <laughs> I'd rather I'd rather make the liberal men cry than the liberal women. So there we go. All right. So I, this is West Virginia, and we're pretty much guaranteed some form of conservative Republican, right? On your on your website, you say and this is just a quote from the website: "As a nation, we stand at a pivotal juncture. As a state, we are faced with decimating circumstances. If we fail to act now, there will be no second chance to rescue both our state and our country." That's that's a lot of. Um, uh, Sturm and Drang right there. You know, that's pretty pretty strong language. Expand on that, if you could. Yeah, so specifically speaking about West Virginia, you know, this, this applies to the country well, but specifically West Virginia, it is dying. Uh, as we know, we now have two congressional representatives. Uh, we have four electoral votes on presidential election nights. Uh, and we are less powerful in Washington, D.C., uh, on election night as far, as far as choosing the president. We also have less representation in Washington, D.C. for the state of West Virginia. Six of 55 counties grew over the last census period. Only one county, Berkeley County, grew double digits. They grew to the tune of 20 percent. Jefferson County was right behind them, around 9 percent. And uh, the state is in major decline, major decay. It has been since I was a kid. And, and, and we are a state defined by generational poverty. There's a lack of economic opportunity here. Uh, we need to fight to bring economic opportunity here. Because without economic opportunity, there's not going to be much hope for our, our people. The second portion of that is obviously our failed education system. Uh, you cannot have good, school, good communities, good neighborhoods, and a strong economy when you have a failed public education system. Our public education system is currently failed. It must be addressed. The next governor has to fix it and make it a real priority. I don't believe fixing it has really been a priority. Uh, and again, with this recent legislation they passed in the legislature, who are we going to send in from the state to audit and make sure that we're verifying that the ready rewrite plan is going according to plan? Uh, there's no audit process for that right now. Um, obviously, we lead the nation in drug overdose deaths per capita. Uh, we lose people to drugs in this state every day. You're hard pressed to find families out here that don't have a brother, a cousin, a sister, a mom, or a dad that uh, that have lost their lives due to drug overdoses or have been affected negatively as far as their lives are concerned because of drugs. Uh, so we have three systemic problems taking place at once that we have to address simultaneously. Um, there's not a lot of people like me in the state that were born in 1992 and graduated high school in 2010. We're typically in North Carolina, Florida, Texas, even the Northeast. Uh, I even know people that, that go out west. So we have a major catastrophe coming by 2050 because we have to get this state to where we retain our young people. The people that are born and raised here have to be kept here. They have to have opportunity. They feel like they don't have opportunity, so they leave. And we're in two gen- we've had two generations of West Virginians leave the state during this period. Uh, so we're in big, pro- big, big trouble that way. Forgive me, it sounds like you're running for statewide office. No, no, but that, 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 that's West Virginia specifically, uh-huh. to, to answer your question. Um, the nation, though, the reason I'm running for Congress in the 2nd Congressional District is we have to send somebody to Washington, D.C. that's going to stand up and fight the radical left and take back the country as far as our values are concerned, Ju- Judeo-Christian values, 
uh, cap, you know, we need to restore purity and capitalism. Uh, we need to shrink government, reduce government substantially, the bureaucracy. The, the founders at this point would say, I think you guys need to come up with a new social contract because your government is so big and so expansive, it's completely out of line of what our intentions were originally. Um, so, so that's why I'm going there to fight the radical left, but also to help bring opportunity to the second district. I don't think that we've been represented. I, I'm traveling around on my 27 county tour right now and I'm talking to people and they're saying we haven't heard or seen this person. And if we do hear, see this person, it's only because it's an election and they're either looking for money or they're, they're coming in because they have to. You know, I want to serve the people of West Virginia. I want to be involved at the local level the community level, the state level, county by county, and, and bring bring change. But we, we need to go fight for the country because I believe we've lost the country at this point. Bill? Yeah, uh, you've raised two points, or two different uh, issues. One was the education uh, and economic issues, and I disagree with John some. Uh, I think these are uh, nation, national issues as well as state issues. You also uh, started off, and you've picked, and you reverted back to it, that your reason for running for office is to take on the radical left. Uh, Alex, a lot of us, and I think I'm in the majority here, uh, are, are looking for someone that is willing to work across the aisle, to work with each other without labels, without saying that radical or this radical, either side. This is what we need in our country, more so than someone that you mentioned, uh, AOC. Uh, what I'm hearing from you would be the, the Democratic version of AOC. Uh, our country is, is in problems. I, but I think our, prob our country's problem is the fact that we have too many extremes. Now, what you say will play well with the Lincoln dinners and the Eisenhower dinners, the groups of Republicans getting together, as will the other side of the argument with their dinners. But we, so many of us in the center, which I, I think I, I hope I am, uh, looking for somebody that will work together to bridge together. You haven't mentioned this. Is how important is that to you? It, it is on my website, and absolutely, I'm I'm looking to cooperate to get results for people. I think that the people have taken a back seat. Special interest, political interest has taken the front seat. So I want to bring results, and I'm willing to work to get the right results. And and, and, and but we have to stand up and denounce leftism. Now it's it's permeated our society in just about every facet. So it's very important we send people there that are willing to, to attack that. But obviously, I'm going to work to get results. We we have a 31 plus trillion dollar debt. We are going to have a very difficult time paying the interest on this debt by mid century. Uh, we obviously have people that are attacking our Second Amendment rights uh, and trying to bring gun control and, and, and take take guns. We, we can't allow that to happen. We have to stand up and, and fight against that. We're being pushed around on the international stage. Wasteful spending bill after wasteful spending bill. Uh, you know, I could sit here for hours and go into some of the ridiculous spending we saw on that omnibus bill. Uh, so I'm going to be there to, I'm going to have to get along a little bit, bit Bill. I mean, I'm coming in there, or I'm going to be going in there with a uh, little track record and I'm obviously going to, you know, not go in there and be telling people what to do right off the bat. I mean, that's pretty clear. So I'm willing to cooperate and work with people. But what I'm not going to do is sell out my values. And I believe that I'll probably be more unpopular at first because I'm not going to uh, be a corporate puppet. I'm not going to get strong armed like we, we see Joe Manchin getting strong armed uh, with his his recent vote for the for the Green New Deal. Uh, and every other name they want to call it to try to confuse the public. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm not going to be betraying my principles. I'm also not going to be betraying the interests of West Virginians. In some cases, Bill, what I think about a particular issue isn't always going to be the most important thing. What my constituents think about the issue is going to be first of mind for me. Uh, how I particularly feel isn't going to be as important as how the people that I'm representing feel. Uh, I'm going to be representing them and not betraying their interests like our lawmakers are doing currently at the federal level. Alex Gasroot is our guest here on the program. He's running for the congressional seat currently held by Alex Mooney, who is running for Senate. So let's talk uh, first and foremost about the race 
it is undeniable that Riley Moore, the state treasurer, is the leading candidate and has an overwhelming advantage in name recognition around the state. Uh, according to a recent poll, there's a gigantic gap between uh, Riley and everybody else. And when I say gigantic, I mean gigantic. How do you close that gap and become competitive in this race, Alex? Well, we're 13 months away, or you know, close, I guess 12, 12 months and two weeks away. So we have a lot of time. As, as you know, political strategists would say, there's an eternity left in this race. Uh, obviously, we, we registered in the poll that, that you're speaking about, the 88.8% for Riley. Uh, I came in at 4.4%. I've manufactured this candidacy with no money, no name identification, and on top of that, a tough name to say, and no political experience or track record. So the fact that I'm even registering in a statewide poll right now among the 27 counties that the 2nd District encompasses is an incredible feat. Most people would not be able to do that coming in as a political, pure political novice. So our message is definitely resonating with people. Um, now, obviously, you've got to win a race with money. You know, a campaign, it's, it's without money, it's a lot like the body. Without blood, there is no body. Without money, there is no campaign. And we hope that we figured out our money problems uh, here in the last couple of weeks or so. And we, we have people that are interested in us uh, now. And we, we've, we've gotten connected to some of the right people, which is fortunate. Because without getting in those rooms, it's going to be hard to win, obviously. Um, Riley does not have a very good advantage as far as money's concerned. I mean, he raised about 150 grants, about 150 grand more than I raised, but he raised 150 grand in the last quarter. Uh, it's not like he's got seven or eight or $900,000 here a year before the election. Uh, I also think that as we expose his record, uh, particularly what he's done with um, the investment management board, uh, you know, they're, they're, potentially we're going to be in a situation where the people that manage the state's pension plan and their investments, which is heavily tied to retirees, those people that manage our investments that get returns, they're probably going to stop doing business with the state of West Virginia because of what Riley did. What did Riley do? Well, he proxy voting. So, you know, these companies, they're, they're not going to be allowed to, uh, in, you know, in, in invest in um, green ESG sort of measures. So, that is going to make a lot of these money managers say, okay, well, we can't you know, invest in this, we can't invest in that, so we're gonna stop doing business with the state of West Virginia. That's a potential right now, and that's you know, information that I've gotten from people that are you know, involved, obviously, with the Investment Management Board. But yet, you, earlier, you, uh, you were going to push back against some of these liberal movements of which ESG is part of. So you have problems with ESG on one hand, and that you're saying Raleigh uh, used his office to our disadvantage because he was working against ESG. To me, you're trying to have both sides of the, of the pie. No, I, I'm going to put retirees first them having lower returns for retirees because of how we're investing their their dollars isn't something that I'm going to accept. So retirees because of what Riley's done are actually going to see less returns. And that's during a time where the cost of living as we know is almost untenable whether it's home heating or 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 the groceries. So uh yeah, I'm going to put retirees before I go fight, you know, ESG and, and woke corporations. I don't think Riley's going to be able to do much in D.C. either on the ESG front. You know, uh, I think that that we we should be very mindful about lowering retirees' returns uh, that are in tough situations right now economically. You, go ahead. <clears throat> Among your qualifications, you listed that you are not a corporate puppet. Right. And then we talk about fundraising. At what point does fundraising tip over into corporate puppetry? Yeah. Again, I'm going to tell everybody that I deal with that I'm not betraying my principles. I am not going to be bought or paid for by anybody. I don't want big lobby money. I don't want pharma money. I don't need any of that. But without money, a campaign dies. It's like blood yeah. in the body. Exactly. That's what you said. So, And, and yeah. what politicians... We're, we're going to raise money, but we're not going to be beholden to special interests. Just because somebody donates to our campaign or is, is behind our candidacy doesn't mean that they're somehow in charge. 
But have you ever heard a politician say anything different than what yeah. you've just said? That's what everybody says. I'm going to take money, but you're not going to erode my, my principles. Right. Uh, before Lita, are have you approached Club for Growth? Because Club for Growth is getting involved in several of the races. Will they get involved in your race? I don't know. I have yeah. not spoken with anybody okay. from Club for Growth. Club for Growth has not contacted me. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, by the way, got a text from Treasurer Riley Moore who said that uh, what he has done only has to do with voting, not with investing. Yeah, the, the proxy voting, yes. Proxy voting. So uh, there you go on that. So, Alex, we've got about a minute left in the segment. The minute or so is yours. Go ahead and talk to our audience as to why they should consider you for the second congressional seat. We need to bring generational change to West Virginia. We need to send somebody to Washington, D.C. that's going to denounce this leftism in our nation, this neo-Marxism. We need to send somebody to Washington, D.C. that's ready to secure the border. Congress needs to craft legislation, send the military there to secure the border, form a mass deportation task force. We have to stand up to our foreign adversaries and enemies. We are not going to have terms dictated to us by countries that literally have millions of their people in the streets begging for their freedom, particularly Iran uh, and, and, and other nations. Uh, so we need uh, to send young generational change to West Virginia, but we also need to have somebody that's a principled conservative that understands what being a conservative is and is willing to bring real results for the people of West Virginia and represent the people. Because the people that have been in charge now have left our state and our people behind, and you see that with the outcomes we have. So uh, we need to get very bold about who we send. I'm also not involved in the political class. And as we've talked about here a little bit today, not bought and paid for. We need to send people like that to Washington, D.C. to take our country back and save our republic. And Alex, are you anywhere else in the Eastern Panhandle today doing anything official with your campaign? I'm actually heading to Tyler County to speak to the Republican Executive Committee in Tyler County. Um, that will be our 19th county that we hit out of the 27 counties. So uh, we've been very active, and again, we've, we've manufactured this candidacy, and we're going to continue to run and, and get our message out. Because our message, it is resonating with people, uh, young, old, rich, and poor. Uh, I do have one quick question for you because the complaint about Alex Mooney not being in his district or being seen in his district, not a new one. It's, it's one, frankly, since he's been in office that people have come on in this program and complained about, and that's people from various political parties, including his own and, and walks of life and whatever. And we've asked Alex about that. He said, listen, I'm in Washington, D.C., voting three, four days a week. I have to be there to record my votes, and I'm home on the weekends. So, you know, I'm, I'm in my district. Uh, what of it if you're in that seat and you're required to be in Washington, D.C. to vote three, four days a week, and people say, well, where is he? He should be in his district. And you, what, what, uh, what's your plan for being seen in the district when you have to be in D.C. so much? Yeah, well, you know, obviously I'm very passionate about this and I'm, I'm wanting to serve the people. So I'm going to be involved in all 27 counties and probably all 55 counties as we go. Uh, Alex Mooney's been in Congress for eight years. And everywhere I'm showing up right now, I'm hearing from people that are saying we've never seen him, never heard from him. And we're, we have seen him recently or we have heard from him recently, but that's only because he's running a U.S. Senate campaign. So, I, again, we need leaders that are going to be involved with the people, that are going to represent the people and show up. So I will be willing to – I'm going to be running a crazy schedule, obviously. So I'm going to be in the state when I'm not in D.C. D.C. is the swamp. We're going there to fight, but we're going to we're going to talk to our, our constituents. And we're going to travel around, do the different committees, do the different Lincoln Day dinners, go to these city halls, go to these county commissions, get involved with different organizations within West Virginia and, and our communities, and bring – real results to people and, and and one thing you're not going to be able to say about me is i'm nowhere to be found i'm going to be everywhere how do people find out more about your campaign you can go to my um website gasaroo the number four wv.com uh, you can also follow us on facebook um, and you know if you have any questions there's a there's a number there that you can call you can leave a message we've had several people that are interested in our campaign and and we're talking to people every day on the phone and in person and we're also working a real job all right and that's g a a s e r u d alex good to see you